the Enfield had some serious street cred. Everywhere, everywhere I went, I, it would always draw a crowd. No one would be interested in me. Everyone would want to talk about the bike. And then when people found out that I'd ridden it all the way to wherever the heck I was from London, that was like mind blowing to them. Episode 283, an epic motorcycle journey through West Africa on a Royal Enfield with Luke Jelmy. Support for the Adventure Sports Podcast comes from Kind, makers of healthy and delicious snacks. Now you can try their sample box with 10 different Kind bars for just $10 with free shipping, a $20 value. For details, go to kindsnacks.com slash adventure. This episode is sponsored in part by Health IQ. Health IQ uses science and data to secure special rates on life insurance for health-conscious people. Learn more and get a free quote online at healthiq.com slash adventure. You're listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast, brought to you by 180 Tech. We talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there. Now here's your host, Kurt Linville. Hi, friends. Welcome again to the Adventure Sports Podcast. This is your host, Kurt Linville. You know, I have a fantastic guest for you today. He is in Paris right now is where I caught up with him. He's from Australia, but he's one of these world-traveling guys who has amazing stories to tell. A while back, he decided to go on an epic motorcycle adventure that led him through lots of countries and uh, spent probably the majority of his time in Africa, where he had amazing adventures and experiences, life-changing experiences. I'm excited to visit with him today about motorcycle adventure travel, or maybe we should say adventure motorcycle travel. Luke Jelmy, <laughs> welcome to the program. Uh, thanks for having me, Curtis. I appreciate it. Uh, you bet. It's it's an honor to have you on the show, man. This is going to be a lot of fun. We love yeah. adventure travel on the Adventure Sports Podcast, and we also love motorcycles. And when we can put the two together, it always makes for a fantastic show. So I That's think, a win. yeah, it's hard to tour around the planet on a motorcycle without having amazing adventures. Would you agree with that? Well, I've, I've seen even harder ways of doing it. I kept passing Japanese people on, on push bikes in West Africa. So there are people doing it even <laughs> tougher than I was. I, I don't know how they do it. I was having a tough enough time with a motor between my legs. But um, yeah, it, it, it was it was pretty crazy. Well, that's fun, man. That's really fun. So let's start with just a sketch, not not the full story, just the sketch. You're in <laughs> Australia. You decided for some reason to take off on this epic adventure, and then that took you into England and into mainland Europe and into Africa. So when did this happen, and what did I miss? Yeah, so it happened a couple of years ago, and it basically kind of happened in exactly the way that you described it. it 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 kind of all came together by an accident. I just sort of on a, on a whim quit my job one day and uh, booked a one way ticket to London. And then yeah, the winter of the winter of England kind of chased me down through, like you say, continental Europe until I got to the bottom of Spain. And it was just on a motorbike. It's a bit cold and miserable in the wet. So I decided just why not Africa and. Um, I I was completely unprepared. I had no idea what to expect. I didn't speak any of the languages. And um, I just ended up kind of just lucking my way all the way through Africa, top to bottom, through 20-something countries all the way to South Africa. Wow. Okay, so that's, yeah. the, that's the bullet point sketch. we got to get into the meat of of why and how <laughs> yeah, and, yes. and what yeah. happened. So let's start with Pe- People why. ask me that quite a bit, like, what the heck were you thinking? Why on earth Africa? And right. um, a lot of people, when they do Africa, they, they have it all planned out and they, they take it very seriously, uh, which is probably the right thing to do. But um, I, I didn't do that at all. I just kind of took it one day at a time and one country at a time and sort of learnt on the job. Wow. Well, let's go back to Australia before we jump all the way fast forward to Africa. I've got to know what you were doing in Australia and why you decided to kind of drop everything and jump on a motorbike. Yeah, so I was I was 26 or 27 years old, and um, I had a really good job. I'd worked really hard to get a, this job. It was a, a working at a 
an engineering company and uh, it was the job I'd wanted. It was the job I'd studied hard for and I'd been working in it for four years and it was kind of, I just got out of the graduate program and I was really sort of feeling it out. And I kind of had this moment where I, I realized if I continue doing this, I'll end up by being 60 year old engineer. Like it's the, the next, the next reasonable hurdle or the next goal is kind of retirement. And that scared the bejesus out of me. So I was like, Oh my God, if, if I don't change something, if I don't change something now, I'm going to end up doing this forever. I'm going to do something really stupid, like get a girlfriend or, or buy a house or something like that that's going to pin me down and I won't be able to make these kind of big changes. And so on a whim, I've kind of quit everything, uh, quit the job, and um, I booked a one-way ticket to, to England to start off with. And, um, yeah, I had no idea what I was going to do. I, um, all I knew is that I wanted to kind of create a bit of distance between me and my job to see if it was really something that I wanted to do with my life. And, um, and yeah, it turns out that I don't. <laughs> wow. So I, 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 I want to do something different. <laughs> we've got to unpack that just a little bit because, sure. I mean, you're saying that you were working for four years. Now, that's enough time to know better, but you're still early in your career. <laughs> four years is not a yeah. long time in a career. And you're looking 40 years down the road saying, well, the next big hurdle, if I continue on this track, is retirement. Do I want my whole life to go like this? Yeah, and I think I think a lot of people have that in their their mid to late twenties when all through school they've kind of been either well, I would say working my hardest, but a lot of people maybe wouldn't say they were working the hardest at school. But in in school you're kind of directed into your career, and and once you start studying at university or college or whatever, you you kind of you you kind of on the rails. You and and you never really take the time to sit down and have a good think about what you really want to do with your life, like, or, or what you really would like to do with your time. What, what are you really interested in? And you kind of end up picking a career that makes sense rather than a, a sort of a vocation that you'd really enjoy. Um, and so I think a lot of people have this kind of feeling in their late twenties when they're like, when did I choose this? Like, when did I choose to be an engineer? And is this something that I really want to do for, you know, for the rest of my life. And if, if that's not something that I want to do, then what am I doing here? Like, why don't, <laughs> when, when, when am I going to make that change if not today? So I think, I think quite a lot of um, overlanders end up in that kind of situation uh, or, or end up in their situation of doing a lot of overlanding travel in, it all starts with that kind of snap decision to just try something different and, and see where life can take you because, uh, yeah, it, it is a long way to look ahead to being 60 years old, but I couldn't see another way that that would change, that that my life would be different if I carried on doing things as they were. So I kind of thought, well, life's pretty short. It, if, if you're going to change it, you better change it soon. So mm. book the ticket. <laughs> Wild. So sounds like it was a quick decision. And... Yeah, very much a snap decision. I, I got, uh, I was sitting in my office one day and I kind of just booked the flight and I was like, okay, the flight to London is booked. Uh, I spent about a thousand dollars on it or something like that. And I'm like, well, this is happening now. And, um, I was freaking out about how I was going to do all the stuff that I need to do, like quit the job and can the rent and, and like move all my stuff somewhere and how was I going to do all this kind of all, all the logistics of of leaving indefinitely and it was really easy <laughs> once I booked the ticket it was surprisingly easy from there it kind of all took care of itself in a weird way it, it yeah wild so you book a ticket to uh to England but you don't have a motorcycle that you're taking with you so from the get-go, were you planning on grabbing a bike in England? That was that was my whimsical, romantic idea was to to get there and buy a motorbike and just do a bit of touring. I yeah, or, or do some backpacking. But when I arrived in London, I kind of said, "No, nah, I'm, I'm definitely going to get a bike." It was just a question of which one. Well, I heard 
that you had an 800 GS back in Australia. <laughs> which, which would be the appropriate choice, don't you think? <laughs> well, that to me is the ultimate adventure bike. And a lot of people like the 1200 better because of the, the extra CCs and carry more gear and that stuff. I like the 800 my, because my, I my, like the lighter my, bike. Yeah, my dad has a 1200 and I feel like I'm sitting in a lounge chair when I'm riding that thing. <laughs> and and what's worse is I'm, I'm not short, I'm six foot, but I, I still can only just get my toes on the ground when, I'm, when it's at a standstill. So I, wow. I couldn't control that. The 800's more of a fit for me. But it, it's a very German bike. It's it's extremely German. Well, in the end, you did not use the 800 for your trip. No, much and too German. It was. <laughs> it, it, I was going for something with a little bit more character. Okay, so you you quit your life in Australia. You jump a plane. Now you're in in London, right? Right, right. In London, and wondering. It, you got to find a bike and where you're going to go. And I mean, this is, this is not an overly planned trip, is it? No, it's not. So I've, I've kind of, I've, I, in, in, in another kind of snap decision, I've, I've decided to buy a Royal Enfield. (laughs) A Royal Enfield. A Royal Enfield. Yes. You you mentioned character. They're beautiful bikes. Yes. They have a lot of kind of retro, almost cafe racer look to them. And uh, mm. I, 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 I fell in love with it on site. So I, and, and it, it looks, it's a gorgeous motorbike. And then you, you hit the ignition and it just, the sound it makes, I, I, I call it a baby Harley sound. It's like a baby Harley <laughs> Davidson. It's like all of the oomph of a Harley all down into one single cylinder. So it's like, it's like driving a tractor. It's there's something really satisfying about it. I love it. Okay, so I, I gotta ask though, you don't necessarily know what you're gonna get into on your motorcycle adventure at this point, but you know that you if, left the if, right bike behind, and you're buying a bike that <laughs> may or may not be the right bike. Am I right here? Well, yeah. I it, it was never my plan to do serious touring. I um I I was just kind of gonna. S- buy the bike and then ride around and see some things and see what happened. So I, I never really had the chance to kind of weigh up the pros and cons of which would be the perfect suited bike for a tour through Africa. I kind of just picked the bike that my heart wanted. I just, this is the one that I wanted. This was my dream bike. It had nothing to do with the function. It was all about the ride. And so I picked the bike and um, and then the trip kind of happened around it rather than picking the trip and then picking the right bike for it. And I, in hindsight, it was the best thing I could have done because we'll, we'll get to it, but I don't think I could have done a trip through Africa on a GS. I don't think I could have made it. Wow. Well, I think I have to ask for an explanation on that then. You said you don't think you would have made it on the GS. Why? Yeah, so it's... Uh, it, when you break it down, riding from London all the way to Cape Town, it's it's three it's what is it thirty thousand kilometers, mm. give or take, because my odometer broke. So <laughs> I don't know exactly how many kilometers I did. I know it's somewhere in the range of thirty thousand kilometers, so that would be about what twenty thousand miles. And it it took a year and a half. So. It, it's a lot of riding. You're going to be spending a, a massive, massive amount of time in the saddle. And when you're riding, there's nothing else. It's not like when you're driving a car or, or, or when you can put the radio on or listen to some music or kind of you know, break it up a little bit. It, it's On a motorbike, it's literally just you and the motorbike. So you're looking at hundreds of hours of just you and your bike. And if you don't love the bike, it's not going to last. You know what I mean? Yeah, the, the relationship between the rider and the bike, you, you get burned out. Absolutely. If, if, if you're not loving every minute on the bike, or if, if, if it's not a real kind of relationship that you have with the machine, it's, uh, it's just not going to be the... A, it won't be the same, and B, I'm not sure if I would have been able to handle it if I woke up every morning and saw the GS and thought, oh, it's a GS, like it, it, a GS is hardly, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's an incredible motorcycle. It's probably, it, it's got to be up there with the best motorcycles in the world, but it's just not something that gets you excited, if you know what I mean. 
Mm, okay. Well, I have to ask about the tires. I know that people are thinking, well, this this infield, <laughs> it's not quite the adventure bike. It's not going to do as well once you get off the pavement. Did you have to change out tires and make adjustments to make it work? I, I did. As soon as I hit some sand in Mauritania, I knew that it wasn't going to last too long on the road slicks. So um, I, I switched to knobblies pretty quick. But I actually got a no- really nice pair of Bridgestone knobblies. So it, um, it, it was – my, my favorite thing about the Enfield is that it's so small that if you're ever going to fall off, you can always just put your feet down. Right. And, and I use that out quite a bit. Um, whereas anyone who's ridden a GS before, you know that w- once you're going, you need to kind of go for it. Because if you come to a stop, you're going to fall over, you're going to crash, and then you've got a deadlift, a 200 and something kilo motorbike. I don't know how much it weighs, but I'm sure it weighs a ton. And the, on the end field, I, I, I very rarely dropped it. Well, that's interesting. You know, I've always preferred a smaller bike myself, even though I'm also a tall guy and I'm 6'2". But I've always preferred right, a smaller right. bike for a similar reason. I like to be able to throw the bike around instead of the bike throwing me around. Absolutely. I, I would be terrified if I was on a big that twelve going off road on that twelve hundred GS would be just a terrifying experience. There would be nothing enjoyable about it at all. It would be like impending doom constantly. But on the end field you could kind of just chill a bit. Or you, you, or maybe not chill because when you were off road you were constantly banging the bike around. It was constantly taking damage. Whereas a GS wouldn't really take any damage unless you drop it. Right. Uh, the Enfield takes damage just all the time. So <laughs> just bouncing. Uh, yeah, yeah, it just smashing the smashing all the undercarriage on rocks and uh, bouncing around all over the place and um, smashing the side stand and center stand. They broke pretty quick. <laughs> um, it it gets they get, Africa will bang up a bike with low clearance very fast. Yeah, no doubt. Well, so we've established that this was a last-minute decision. We established that you didn't really get the bike for the trip, but you got the bike you loved. But let's get back to the guts of this. How did it feel when you quit your job and got on the plane? I mean, was it scary? Terrifying. Absolutely <laughs> complete. When, when you kind of realize that what you've been working towards over the last few months is entirely dissolving your life, it, you have a real kind of existential crisis moment where you're like, oh, my God, like I've wor- I worked so hard to get that job and now I've I've nuked it. And, and my house, it's nuked, girlfriend broken up with like I've made you, you realize all the sacrifices that you're going to be making to do what you're doing. And it's it's really scary. It's really, really scary. Um, but at the same time, you. I've I've never ever ever met anyone who said the who said you know what I really really regret that time that I went traveling. You'll mm. never hear anyone ever say that. I really regret that time that I went traveling. Uh, I've never heard it said. So I kind of stuck with that and and thought I'm I'm not going to end up regretting this one way or the other, and uh, just kind of went with it. Wow, you know I. I think that's a testimony to people because life, even society, is just not arranged for people to do what you did. You know, you mentioned like you're kind of up against the ropes. You know, even more so these days in the uh, in America, student loans to get to college. It's about the only way now that people can can swing it. It's really tough to work your way through school like you might may have been able to do 20 years ago. But that means that the day you graduate, you have loans to contend with, and that feeds you directly into that job. And it can't be any job you want. It has to be a job that's substantial enough to pay those loans. Yeah, so you kind of get stuck in a, a rat race that ends up being a meat grinder, don't you? It's, yeah. It's, you, you, you're trapped and there's no sort of way out. So, yeah, you, I, you, you defi- it, it, it's not quite the same in Australia. We don't quite... Um, the government takes care of quite a bit of our education fees, so we don't feel quite the same pressure uh, in terms of the bank coming knocking on your door saying you owe us. Um, the government's a bit more quiet about how much we owe them, uh, but <laughs> the Australian government that is right. Um, but yeah, you you definitely, or for me at least, I, I definitely felt all of the 
kind of the opportunity cost of quitting all of this whole life thing. And um, what I was, I, I, I was acutely aware of what I was giving up to do this trip. But it's it still, even at the beginning, it still went felt worth it. It, I, I, I felt vindicated practically the whole way. So was there something that stood as a real barrier to you doing this that you had to overcome before you finally committed and said, I'm gone? Yeah. So the thing that, the thing that pushed me over the line was the thing that really pushed me over the line. I, I'd, I've been thinking about it for a, a number of months, but I, I saw a guy, um, I was just taking a lunch break at, um, at, at, at for a lunch break from work. And there was a guy, a hobo, or at least he looked like a hobo, sitting on a park bench in the beautiful sunshine uh, in front of a lake. It was picturesque, and he was just enjoying his day, just sitting there taking the air. And I was thinking, here I am, stuck in my cubicle, up, you know, 20 floors up in the sky, uh, working away in front of, you know, all these computer screens, and here's this guy, he's been sitting out here for who knows how long, just enjoying the lake, enjoying the sunshine. And he's got nothing. He's, he's got nothing. And yet he's having a better day than I am. Wow. And I kind of had this moment where I was like, I would totally on the spot trade places with this guy. So I'll take nothing and sit out here and, you know, enjoy the beautiful day. And he can have everything and go back and work. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Like, it, I, it kind of made me, re, it gave me a perspective that I could look at my choices from, which is, you know, I don't need all this stuff. I, I don't need to work when, and I'm, I'm sure if you asked him, he would gladly swap places with me because everyone kind of wants what they can't have. Yeah. But in, in any case, it kind of made me go, you know what, I, I don't need this career thing. Uh, I want to enjoy the sun shining as well and uh, and and set off set off on this big journey. Mm. Hey friends, Kurt here. You know, we might have the healthiest audience of any podcast on the planet. I don't know. It it, it just Seems to me that people that are out there doing adventure sports have to be pretty healthy. They appreciate being healthy, and they love to get out there and move. And we recently got a new sponsor, Health IQ, and they reward people who love to be healthy. This is cool stuff. So do you exercise five times a week? If so, then you probably think you deserve a different rate on your life insurance. You're not the smoker. You're not the one who's out there abusing his or her body and and having a lot of health issues that result. Instead, you're out there moving and eating right and doing right things. So shouldn't your premiums be lower? Health IQ uses science and data to secure special rates on life insurance for health-conscious people like cyclists, runners, strength trainers, vegans, and more. Matter of fact, research shows that those who frequently exercise with some intensity have a 22% lower cancer risk, a 56% lower heart disease risk, and up to a 34% lower risk of an early death. So why not get rewarded for that? Historically, you get penalized for your family history, body mass index, and other attributes, but you don't get rewarded for your health-conscious lifestyle. Well, Health IQ does reward you for your health conscious lifestyle with special rates on life insurance. How cool is that? To get more information and a free quote, go to healthiq.com forward slash adventure and make sure you do use that forward slash adventure that makes sure that they know where you heard about them on the Adventure Sports Podcast. So healthiq.com forward slash adventure. I think there are kind of stages to adventuring 
And, and I say that because everybody starts somewhere. They start at a level that is a little uncomfortable, but then it becomes comfortable when they realize, oh, this is completely doable. And whatever their adventure is, then maybe they have the guts to go the next level, right? And yeah, definitely. A little it's a, bigger. So, f- did you experience yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. You're 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 doing little graduations on almost a, a, a daily level when it comes to overlanding, and 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 then there's some big graduations. So you get some massive level up moments, like when even even for me, just crossing the border from England over into France. So you're going from speaking English to speaking French was for me was a massive level up. Like I, I kind of I, I immediately felt terrified and, and wanted to go straight back to England because I'm like, I can't talk to anybody. They drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> I, I can't understand what the heck is going on. Like I didn't even know how to buy petrol. I didn't know which was their word for petrol or because and which was their word for diesel. And um even even stuff like that, I was like, God, I want to go straight back to England. But then you kind of, I, I stayed in France and, and kind of got comfortable with it, started talking some of the words. And before you know it, you're, you, you feel comfortable there. And um, so that, that felt like a kind of a graduation. You've, you've got a new kind of comfort level. You've pushed your boundaries of, of what, you were, what you were happy to do. And then you go to Africa and then that's, that's that graduation on like, a whole nother level, a whole nother level. And, and that's just Morocco, which is pretty tourist friendly. Right. And before you know it, you, before you know it, you're walking through Nigeria in, in Lagos, like through the market quarter, which is the dodgiest part. And you're feeling comfortable doing it. And you're like, how the heck did this happen? Like, how did I go from being scared of France to walking around Nigeria uh, talking with the locals it's it's kind of a, a weird thing that you slide into but yeah every now and again you catch yourself going how the heck did i become comfortable with this wow well i gotta throw something out there i have a a friend from years past and one of the things that he often said is no matter where you go there you are yes <laughs> which which which, which, which can be great, but it can also be quite disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I had to throw that out there. Depends on the perspective. It. Yeah, a candid question. I mean, there, there are multiple facets to that statement. One is, yeah, you go somewhere and you, ex- you have new experiences. That's one interpretation. The other is, if there's something about yourself you're trying to get away from, wherever you go, you're still there. Absolutely. Was there an and, element and I... of that with you? Completely. So every, and, and this, this is besides the trip. But every single time I get off a plane, I'm always disappointed. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> when, 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 you, when you're thinking of the trip in advance, you're thinking of how great it's going to be. And in your head, you kind of dream up this whole, like it's going to be a real game changer. Or it's going to be so different and awesome. And then when you get there, you just find that it's another here and now. You, you never get to escape this here and now. And every single time I kind of trick myself that it's going to be different. So, yeah, every, every single time uh, I'm always disappointed with planes. But in, in terms of I, I think that's where overlanding can be different because you'll never pick the exact moment when it happens. But you change, you, right. you become you become a different person that the old person wouldn't recognize. Or they would, but not really. Um, you change a lot. You change almost daily, but it's still you, but it's a different you, that's for sure. Well, as you describe the challenges of going, you know, from England into France, and then, you know, that's like from a one to a two, <laughs> and then you said from from France on into Africa, it, it was more like a, a two to a 20, right? <laughs> and but you're yeah, growing oh, I, with I, this. I, I always, I always, I, I thought that going from England to France was a one to a ten. I, <laughs> I thought that was a huge deal, and then going to Africa was just off the charts. It was. Uh, I, I thought I was going to die. Uh, not that I was going to die. That uh, that that I was going to have all of my stuff stolen, and that I would probably die. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's that's a crazy perspective. Uh, to start a journey like that with, 
Um, sounds to me like that could be kind of tough to overcome. Why did you go if you felt that way? Uh, it, it, it was kind of like a game of chicken with myself. Um, but it was, it was like a, a self dare that kind of went a bit too far. Um, all, all the way, all the way South to into, so from France into Spain, I'd been thinking a lot about what the heck I was going to do next because Spain is kind of the end of the road when it comes to Europe. You can't go any further south to get get away from the winter um, unless you switch continents. Uh, and I was kind of thinking I might go to South America, but logistically that was not easy. Um, that was going to involve a lot of shipping and just a pain in the butt. Uh, so I ended up just I, I was I, Africa was on my mind. It was definitely something I was thinking of, and. Um, then I met an, another Australian in a hostel in Barcelona, and uh, he was a crazy man. He he had done <laughs> all of all of Africa, top bottom to top, uh, or, or down the east up the east side. Sorry, so he'd he'd done a bunch of countries up east in Africa, and then got deported out of Ethiopia for not having his papers right. Got deported into Yemen, nearly got carjacked in Yemen. Then went and hung out in Iran and Iraq. And then I, I think at the time he went through Syria. Uh, don't quote me on that one. I, I think he, he, he's, the, he's the kind of guy who would go through Syria. Right. And then um, went all through Europe and, and we met in Barcelona. And I'm like, and, and I sat him down and plied stories out of him with many, many beers. And uh, I was completely hooked. I, I wanted stories exactly like he had, like, the time that he had malaria and typhoid at the same time in oh. the Republic of Congo, like oh. in Congo. That's awful. And, and he's talking and he, he's telling me over a few beers what it feels like to be dying, like literally dying. And I'm like, that's incredible. It's incredible. <laughs> if they hadn't have got him to a hospital in time, he would have just flat out died. He would be dead. And I was like, I want, st- I don't, I, I don't want that story, but I want stories like this guy, like, I want to have those kind of, not those kind of experiences again, but I want to have experiences like be that windswept and interesting traveler. I was kind of obsessed with it. And mm. I, so I asked him, I'm like, well, what are you doing next? And he was like, oh, I was thinking of heading down to, to West Africa. Maybe I don't really know. And I'm like, you can't do that. Do you, how are you going to do that? He's like, oh, I was just going to hitchhike. So he was going to hitchhike down West Africa. And I'm like, that's crazy. I'm like, instead of hitchhiking, you can get on the back of the Enfield. How's that sound? And he's like, yeah, sure. I'll, that sounds good. And so we <laughs> rode we, and I was like, that did it done. We're going to Africa. And, uh, we rode together from Barcelona all the way to Dakar, which is 2000 miles. So it's, that's a hell of a ride for, for someone who was a complete stranger. Not so long ago. A complete stranger uh, we, we, that we, is bona fide crazy in your book at this point. Com- Com- completely crazy, but he's a countryman. He's he's an Australian, so we give him the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> well, it's <neat. laughs> it, can't, it can't be too bad. Uh, here, here's something I have to point out, okay? Sure. You take off, you have dreams, you want to try things. It's a huge challenge to you. But in going, doors start to open. And had you never gone, you never would have met him. And he kind of became your uh, your muse, perhaps, to go ahead and complete yeah. the, the journey, right? Absolutely. So oh, he, he, he was kind of my, my safety blanket. Like I felt ah. so long as he was around, I wouldn't, he'd, he'd tell me if I would do anything stupid or something that I wouldn't do. Like one day he, he goes to me, he goes, do you, we were in, we we're in Morocco. And, uh, he says to me, do you feel like a child? And I'm like, no, what do you mean? Do I feel like a child? He goes, do you feel like a child? And I'm like, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he's like, wearing those shorts, do you feel like a child? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Wearing shorts, do I feel like a child? And he goes, have a look around you. Do you see any men wearing shorts? And so I look all around the marketplace and I'm like, uh, no. And he's like, no, you don't see any men wearing shorts. And I'm like, <laughs> ah, gotcha. Like I might have never made that connection it was little stuff like that. He was kind of just kind of, he, he wasn't that much of a help if, all, all, in all honesty. He was, he was more, 
that I felt safe with him because uh, he'd done it all before. But in terms of actually helping me, he did nothing. So we'd, we'd get to a border post and I'd have to get papers for the motorbike and he'd just walk off and go and sit in the corner. He, he, I think he was keen to kind of let me learn my own lessons, wow. but at the same time, help me out if I ended, ended up really in the crack. So it almost sounds like he, he thought, oh, I've got a ride that I can take for a long way without sticking my thumb up. Yeah, I, th- I think he was pretty thrilled with the arrangement. And, and it's a Royal Enfield as well. I think he enjoyed the motorbike too. But it, 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 it was an absurd image. So he's, we're, we're two up. On an inappropriate, the motorbike was inappropriate already, even just with me on it. And then you put another guy on the back who's carrying all of his luggage, all of my luggage, and it's just, it looked like a scene out of the Motorcycle Diaries. <laughs> well, I was going to say, it's not easy on a motorcycle to have a pillion. It throws the bike out of balance, right? Yeah. I'll, and then you've got gear on top of this, that. This guy, that's true, but this guy was the perfect pillion. He, like, like I said, he was, he was a crazy guy, but the, the best thing about him is he was very quiet and um, he, he just wouldn't move. So after, after long enough on the motorbike, I'd completely forget that he was sitting behind me and I'd start singing. I would, I would start singing songs like I'm by myself, like go through a few <laughs> songs before I'd realize that he's still sitting on the back of the motorbike Does and he's been listening time? to all of this. <laughs> <laughs> he had to give you a hard time about that. <laughs> no, no, but he wouldn't. He, He's the kind of guy who just wouldn't care. He's like, you can do whatever you want. I don't care. It's no biggie. <laughs> he was a very chilled out dude. I have to point out that had you never left Australia, the doors never would have opened to take you further and further into your adventure. And this guy shows up, gave you some some guidance and some inspiration, and he helped you to make that next bigger leap, right? But that never would have happened if you stayed home. Yeah, he was exactly what I needed at the exact right time. Um, it was it was perfect. It was almost like it was meant to be. And 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 kind of going with your point, if if I had have organized everything in advance and um, had a big plan, I would have never had the flexibility after I met him to say, okay, let's make a new plan then based around you and going around West Africa. Like if I had have already had plans to, I don't know, go check out Portugal or something like that, I would have been too strict in what I was doing to just kind of take it as it comes. Well, there are different types of travelers. You know, some people like to have it planned out. They'd like to know where they're going to be when, at least approximately. They like to know how to get through each border crossing days or weeks or months in advance. They like to know when the trip's going to be over, right? This was not your way at all. No, and, and I, I tend to clash with people like that. It depends. I, I, I really like people like that because if I can fit into their plan, then I just ride the bike and I don't have to worry about anything else. They, they take care of all the planning for me, if that makes sense. <laughs> right. So I just kind of ride their coattails on their awesome plan. But if, if, if they're not happy with me not having a plan, then you, you can tend to clash over things. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Well, I know you have so many amazing stories from what happened in Africa, and I want to get to those in just a minute. But I have to ask, sure. at this point, if you had it to do over, you're back <laughs> before the trip in Australia. If you had to do <laughs> something over, what would you change, or would you change anything? I I would, I would. Um, and and it's only one thing. I th- and it's the reason it's only one thing is because I think most of the lessons that you learn as you go are valuable because you learnt them as you went. I, I think if, if I knew all the answers before I started, it wouldn't have been anywhere near as interesting. Right. But this answer in particular is incredibly important, incredibly valuable, and it adds no it, – it's useless not to know it in advance. So here's, here's the big piece of advice. Go and buy a MasterCard. No, go and buy a Visa card. A Visa card, a not Visa a MasterCard. Card. Do do not buy a MasterCard. Um, MasterCards don't work in West Africa. They don't work anywhere outside of Morocco. Um, and I learned that the hard way. I had a MasterCard and a backup MasterCard, uh, thinking that that covered all of my bases. Because, you know, MasterCard works everywhere. Right. And uh, nope, it totally doesn't. 
and sorting that out from Senegal after I'd bumped Ben for a lot of loans. Um, <laughs> it was just a massive pain. It was just a huge pain. And I, I didn't kind of get any sort of intrinsic value out of learning that as I went. It just plain old sucked. So that's some, that's the only place where I wish I had been more prepared um, <laughs> is, is the MasterCard bit. It, it just, it, it killed me. And what was worse than that is when I finally got, I applied for a visa card back in Australia. I got my parents to ship that to me at a random location in Senegal. And then when I finally got my hands on this visa card that I'd been waiting weeks for, uh, I, the same day that I got it, it got stolen. What? All of my stuff, all of my stuff, everything, not, not everything, but a whole heap of my stuff got stolen. I had my wallet stolen, so that was all. Of, so that was the my two Mastercards and my freshly acquired Visa card gone. I had a thousand dollars worth of American dollars gone. I uh, my camera was gone. My GPS was gone. All of my cash gone, gone. Just everything gone. All in the one hit. Mm. And uh, and so I had to do that whole complete mess of applying for the visa card again oh, while no. I just kind of wallowed, wallowed in Senegal. I was having a nightmare. Hey, Adventure Sports Podcast listeners, have you ever tried a kind bar? You might have seen them in your local grocery store, coffee shop, or gym. They make delicious, healthy snacks using whole ingredients you can recognize and even pronounce. It's a great snack to grab on the go or as a guilt-free indulgence. We've got a special deal for you. For $10, you'll get a box with 10 kind snacks inside, including free shipping. Now that's a $20 value, just 10 bucks. When you order the sample box, you also get to try Kind's Snack Club where you'll receive monthly snacks at a discount starting with 10 bucks off your first snack club order. You shouldn't have to choose between your health and taste when it comes to snacking. To pick up your sample box, go to kindsnacks.com forward slash adventure. That's kindsnacks.com forward slash adventure. By now you certainly know who Bent Gate is. That's for a great reason. Bent Gate Mountaineering has been sponsoring the Adventure Sports Podcast almost from the beginning, and we really appreciate that. They've made it possible for all the great shows to continue coming your way. We want to say thanks by reminding you to go to them for your backcountry gear. If you live in Colorado, then just stop by their store in Golden. If not, go to bentgate.com. They have what you need from the latest ultralight gear to the tried and true classics for climbing, hiking, and camping like Arcteryx, Hilleberg, Nemo, Western Mountaineering, and many more. Need advice? They have you covered there, too. Their staff are passionate adventurers who can offer help from their own experiences. Bentgate also hosts lots of events and speakers. Check out their website to see the schedule and to see all of their products. Help take care of the Adventure Sports Podcast by getting your gear from Bentgate Mountaineering. For a lot of people, this would be the end of the trip. They'd say, okay, enough is enough. I'm out of here. Did I did I mention I got food poisoned for four days? <laughs> no. Is this at the same time? <laughs> so right, yeah, so right a, a day after the stuff got stolen, I got four days worth of food poisoning. Oh. I I couldn't I couldn't leave the the I couldn't leave sighting distance of the bathroom for nearly for like half a week. It oh. was not not fun time. Well, what did you do? How did you manage this? Because travelers eventually find themselves up against a wall like this, and you you continued on. So, how did you manage? Well, I, I, if, I, if, if I didn't have the support of Ben, particularly in Mauritania, where this was before Senegal, where I was just realizing that my credit card wasn't working anywhere, if I didn't have him there to bail me out, um, 
things would have ended up very differently because I ran out of cash right in the middle of the Sahara Desert. And um, there's not a whole lot of options out there for somebody with no <laughs> money and no means of getting money and no backup for money. Um, so if Ben hadn't have been there, I would have been uh, – the mind boggles about how that situation would have ended up. But he kind of he, – he, he lent me some money and got me out of it until I could get the credit card. And um, but but once once I got the credit card, I just kind of kept on going because I mean, what else was there to do? Some people would say you get on an airplane and you fly back to home. I, I've I've got to admit it, it it was tempting a few times to just get on an airplane and go, but it was kind of my pig headedness not to quit. Because it, I, I knew that if at any point in time I got on a plane because I just wanted to go home, I, that I would have quit. And I don't think I would have been able to live with myself after that. So it was, it was a bit of sort of pig-headed bastardry that got me through at times. <laughs> well, I kind of get that. You know, you're in this for the life experience. And you know that if you walk away from it, you miss out on what you're looking for. Yeah. And, and you kind of, you, you know from the start that it's probably going to be tough. Um, so it's kind of when, when it does get tough, you, you shouldn't, I shouldn't really have acted so surprised, (laughs) but if, if I'm honest, Africa definitely has its tough moments and it definitely has its challenges, but on the whole, it was incredible on, on a day to day basis. It was just, just, wow, there's nothing quite like it. And so, yeah, I, I talk a lot about all the bad stories because, you know, they're the fun stories. Right. But um, it, it, you, the, the good stuff doesn't get enough time in the sun. And um, it's incredible. It is really, really good. Well, tell us what your average day was like. Not the bad story day, but just I'm on the bike. I'm traveling through Africa. I'm seeing things. I'm feeling things. Give us the details. Take us there for a minute so that we can be on the bike with you. Well, to do that, you, you're going to need to write three books because, <laughs> because every, every single day is utterly unique. Um, there, there is no par for the course, so it, it, it never gets boring. It, never for an instant are you bored um, because every single mile is different from any other mile that you've ever done before. So it, it's constantly interesting. It's constantly engaging. Um, it's often beautiful. Um, and the people are wonderful and um, always surprising, but, mm. but never the same. So there, there is no it, – it's constantly changing. And, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, which, which as a traveler is sort of what you're going for because you're always on your toes and you're always interested – um, it, it never gets boring. I think the contrast of one's own life experience with the life experiences that they see around them, I think that contrast sometimes is, is what travel is about. Did, did you find that to be true? Yeah, it, 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 it definitely gave perspective. I, I, I actually found that gap hard to cross. Like the, the contrast was so heavy between myself and and anyone that I met, that it was kind of hard to bridge that beyond um, beyond not be we we could we could always get beyond small talk, but never really go much further than that, except with some very special people. So, in in terms of making connections, it was quite often difficult, um, and especially because. And I learned this on a number of occasions. When you do really make a connection with people or with a family or something like that, you're always moving on. Um, right. And so I, I, I had these incredible connections with incredible people who I would love to spend more time with. And then now, I, and, and you know that as soon as you're gone, you're never going to see them again for the rest of your life. So it's, it's quite sad, but it's, it's kind of like kind of like a lightning strike where just because it's quick doesn't mean it wasn't beautiful sort of thing if that makes sense oh yeah it definitely makes sense do you think that your mode of travel helped or harmed and in having been on the back did that help or harm in connecting with uh, the people as you traveled uh i think 
I think the infield itself um, helped just because it was an infield. It, it, moving away from the motorcycle bit, it 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 the 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 infield had some serious street cred. So right. everywhere everywhere I went, I, it would always draw a crowd. No one would be interested in me. Everyone would want to talk about the bike. And then when people found out that I'd ridden it all the way to wherever the heck I was from London, that was like mind blowing to them. So yeah, the the bike the bike helped in places. But th- there were a couple of times on the trip where I would I would pull up on the side of the road after after you know miles and miles of riding, and and take my helmet off, and I I would hear a river rushing uh, right next to just beyond the trees, and uh, it would sound amazing, and then you hear all the birds, and then you hear all the bugs, and you hear all this kind of this noise that you weren't hearing because all you could hear was the roar of a Royal Enfield. Mm. And I was kind of thinking it would be a whole nother level of immersion to either do this by walking or do this by riding a a bicycle. Um, And I I had moments of jealousy for the people who were doing it overland on bicycles because they must really get to feel – the, the nature of a place, the, the, the quietness of, of these beautiful places, whereas my life was never quiet. My right. life was always extremely loud and right in my ears, like the Enfield is a loud beast. And um, so, but, but then I would get on the motorbike and twist the throttle and go, well, that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> riding, riding a bicycle top to bottom through Africa is going to have its own challenges, I'm sure. Oh yeah, and we've interviewed people that have done that, and it's a totally different story <laughs> to what you're yeah, talking the, about. But I, I, I met a Japanese guy who'd been riding for twelve years and had been around the world. It was either three or it was four times. Wow, um, twelve years riding bikes. It was, and he 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 blew my mind. But I, I think it takes a special kind of crazy to think that that's a good idea. <laughs> well, once you've done your first year, then maybe it's a lot better idea to keep going. Yeah, but everything in moderation, though, right? <laughs> right, right. It, you it's, know, it's, for, a, it's a bit extreme for 12 years to do, to I'm just gonna, be riding around the world. Yeah, oh no, I'm with you. It, that's that's a whole other level that I think a lot of us I can, just... Yeah, I, I'm happy to make connections and break connections for a year, but I can't imagine what it's like to make best friends like meet new best friends and then never see them again for the rest of your life kind of thing on a you know on a weekly or monthly basis you meet someone who you who you really get along with and then you never see them ever again and doing that for 12 12 years i'm like how is he not crazy and maybe he is crazy um, maybe they're all crazy. Who knows? Those bicyclers are all nuts. <laughs> well, the, the bicycle tourists that we've had on the show just go on and on about how wonderful it is and how much they enjoy the time, just like you said, being able to experience nature that way. So I think there's something to it, but I think anybody would say that anyone who's willing to walk away from a perfectly good job and a stable place and, and take off on an adventure with an unknown outcome like you did, they might say, well, you're just crazy. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I, more, more than the people who tell me that I was crazy are the people who go, I would love to do that. Yeah. And um, you, you, I, I get quite a lot of, especially people who, who like, for, for the people in their 20s, they're always thinking, oh, I really want to do that. And then you talk to some older people and they're like, damn it, I wish I had have done that. So I, I get less of the crazy stuff and more of the kind of I, I would love to do that sort of thing. Well, and you know which side of the fence the, I'm on there. Yeah, well, it's it's never too late. <laughs> well, I have to say, though, when you were preparing to leave, and your preparation was pretty quick, but I would expect that that's when you get the you're crazy. And then after you've Definitely. already done it, that's when you get the, oh, dang, I wish I could do that, too. Well, ev- everyone at my work was the the dang side. They they were like, "God damn it!" Like, I, I, I why can't I do that? And I'm like, "Come with me if you want." <laughs> like, nothing, nothing stopping you. Like, and and there's 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 a little bit of jealousy going around, 
But anyone who says, you know, oh, I wish I could have your life, I'm like, yeah, but, you know, have a think of the sacrifices that I've made to have it because you could totally have the same life if you wanted to, but um, you've got to be ready to make the sacrifices, which a lot of people don't look at. I, I guess the people who are saying you're crazy can only see the the con sorry can only see the what's the word i'm looking for what's the word i just used the people can only see the help me out here uh, the challenges the or the scary parts or what they have to give up the yeah sacrifice. all of that all, all all that and the sacrifices and then the people who think that it's brilliant can only see the upside of it. i think it takes someone to do it to kind of see both sides of it and to realize that it's it's not as good as you think it is, and it's not as crazy as you think it is. Right. Yeah. It's absolutely. kind of it's kind of a happy it's it's a happy medium. It's Goldilocks. So Luke, I hate to say this, but we're going to run out of time. So we're going to have to find a way to summarize the rest of the adventure, and that's too bad. But that's the way these long adventures go. You actually have written it out though, so people can get the full story. And you mentioned it might done. take three books. So you, you have a trilogy. What about that? I do have a trilogy. I, I, I got told by enough people that I need to write a book. And so I started to, you know, give that a go. And um, I just wrote what I wanted to write. And I, um, I asked a publishing friend of mine how long a, a normal book should be. And he's like, oh, you know, about 60,000 words, 70,000 words. And I'm like, okay, 70. All right. And <laughs> and he goes, how long's your book? And I go, I don't even know. I hadn't even checked. So I did a quick word count and it was 200,000 words. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, right? And he's like, you're going to have to cut two out of every three words. You're going to have to really cut it down. And I was like, I can't cut a single word out of this story without it changing. It, it, it has to be like this. And I thought, well, why not do a trilogy then? Like, all the epics are all done in trilogy. So, bang, let's do a trilogy. Why not? And, uh, yeah, yeah. So, we, we split the giant book into one book. In, so, giant book into three books. And um, it, it actually split up quite nicely. The first book takes it from, from day one of, of quitting the job all the way down to Sierra Leone, which is, like, kind of getting into the heart of West Africa where – things from from Sierra Leone you got countries like Liberia and Nigeria and Ivory Coast and um and Gabon and Congo and that's the kind of bit where it gets crazy and out of control and then there's the end bit where I completely lose my marbles I go totally nuts by the end of the trip um the last third was actually quite tough on me because I was having panic attacks, and, and, but I didn't realize I was having panic attacks. Have you ever had a panic attack before? No. I've, extreme, I, I've experienced anxiety that didn't really have a cause, which is a weird place yes. to be, right? But yes, never a full-blown exactly panic that. attack. So, so it's exactly that. And then add on that kind of weird feeling, add on top of that the feeling like you're actually currently dying of a heart attack. Oh, <laughs> no good, man. It's... it's, it's epic it's full on and um i was having those on a daily basis towards the end of the trip and i just thought i was sick i just thought i was kind of getting a bit a bit crook and um i, I didn't realize what was going on uh and so by the towards the end of the trip i was completely losing it so that's that's the third book and then i i kind of got home and we we got on top of the situation and what was going on with with the anxiety it, it came out of nowhere, but it fed on itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, so self. You, you, yeah, it, it just goes into a vicious cycle of you're feeling anxious, so you get more anxious, which makes you feel like more anxious, and it kind of just goes wild, and then you kind of add panic attacks to that, and what could make you more anxious than a panic attack? So, yeah, by, by the end of it, I was in, in sort of in need of some serious help. So it, 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 it really is a tale of, of three parts. It's the... The naive start, it's the epic middle, and then the crazy finish. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I have to ask, do you know what triggered this? What caused it? Was it diet? Was it too much time on the road? Do you have any idea? Yeah, so while I, I had a panic, the, the first panic attack I had was in Nigeria. It was just a normal day. Um, nothing crazy was happening. 
And then out of nowhere, I felt like I was about to black out. I, I felt like the whole world was doing cartwheels around me and that I was going to drop the bike on a straight. I wasn't even in a corner. Wow. And um, it, 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 it really put me off. It, it had me very confused. I didn't know what was going on, that maybe I ate something or maybe I had some African worm that was eating my brain. <laughs> I, like the, the number of reasons for what was happening were diverse. And, and believe me, I explored all of them, but I couldn't get to the bottom of what was going on. And then it, it went away and I didn't have any problems with it again. And then in Congo, I had lots of problems with it. And I think it was just kind of, it was a reaction to the stress. But the reason the reason I had a problem with it is because it would pop up in places that weren't particularly stressful. Right. So if I'd had a stressful week um, or something stressful had happened days ago, or maybe something stressful was coming up in the future, but I didn't particularly feel stressed at that moment, I would just have a panic attack. And so I never really related it to my stress. I just thought that I was dying of some exotic African disease, which, you know, doesn't exactly help you calm down. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, I, I could never put my finger on it. But by the time I got home, I thought that I was going out of my mind. And um, so by the time I went and saw a doctor, he was like, oh, you've just got a common anxiety problem. It's no big deal. And I'm like, but I feel like I'm dying. And he's like, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> like you feel like you're dying. And and it, it's so severe that he's like, we'll give you some brain scans just to be sure that you don't have something wrong with your brain. But if you don't have, if it's not that, then yeah, it's just going to be a simple anxiety and we can fix that. And wow. I was like, so let me get this straight. It's either I've got something eating my brain or I've just got some simple anxiety. And he's like, yeah. And so that kind of gives you an idea for the level of severity of the feeling of an anxiety problem, if that makes sense. Sure, sure. Well, how did the trip end? You just said when I got back home. So what happened? How did you get there? Yeah. So for the last two months of the trip, I was really just grinding it out. Um, from from the two Congos, I, I had a bit of a nightmare through the Congos. Cong, the, Cong, the two Congos were not a fun time for me. And uh, by the time I got through there and into Angola and then Namibia and then South Africa, each day was just its own small grind. Like even though, even though getting out of the Congos, everything was fine again and it was pretty easy riding, I just wasn't in a good space. I, I wasn't I, – in, in short, it was a nightmare. Mm. And, and the nightmare was all in between my ears. So I, I was very tempted to quit. But I, I ended up grinding it out all the way down to Cape Town because it's what I wanted to do. And I knew that I'd never be able to forgive myself if I didn't just get it done. Even though it was never my goal to start with, it felt like something that I should do. Like, right. get to the bottom. get see, see all of it. Get to the bottom. And uh, I couldn't handle the idea of quitting. So I got to the bottom in, in Cape Town. And I, I spent a couple of weeks there trying to ship the bike. And then one day I just had this monstrous, absolutely huge panic attack. And uh, I, that morning, I booked my flight that day and got on a plane four hours later for Australia. I was just <laughs> out. I was like, just get me off this continent. I want to go home. So did so the bike make I, it home I, too? I, I, I left the motorbike behind and just got on a plane and left. Wow. And uh, which, which was, it was, that was a level that, that kind of gives you an indication of how bloody awful it was that I could leave behind, you know, my, my pride and joy. Uh, but I ended up getting it home shipped. I, I kind of managed to ship it remotely and, uh, it, it arrived home in Australia a couple of months later. Okay. So you got the bike back, but that really does illustrate something there because this isn't just a bike that you really like that, that you connect to. This is a bike you've now traveled. What did you say? 30,000 kilometers on. It is your companion at this point. You should see it. You should see what it looks like. I haven't, I haven't. <laughs> I haven't cleaned it since Africa, and it is just, it, it looks the business. It looks like it's been hard places. <laughs> that's fun. Yeah, that's really fun. So you get back to, to Australia, and you find out that what you have is not uncommon and that you're going to be all right. And so yeah, I, I have to go back to Barcelona 
the night that you met Ben <laughs> and you, you got all the stories out of him over some beers, right? And you said, yep. I got to be this guy. I want to be the one who has those stories. <laughs> yeah. So are you that guy now? Did it work? Well, uh, you, you have to read the book and then you can tell me. <laughs> okay, well, tell us about the you, books. You, you can tell me if the stories are good enough. How can people um, get a hold so, of your so books? books? I know they're going to know. The, yeah, so the, the first book is available right now. So you can get that now online for free. Um, it, and not a lot of people do that, sell their books for free. Uh, but it, it's something that it, it costs me nothing to do. I loved writing the book. And, um, yeah, I, I just want people to be able to read it and maybe be inspired themselves to make a big change like that. So you can kind of, you even in the first few pages, you can kind of get some tips on if, if you're feeling a bit like this, that you want to get out and you want to make a change, you can see how easy it is. So uh, if, if I can be, I'd, I'd like to hope to, that the books could be an inspiration for some people who, who want to try this out for themselves. So well, I'm sure they are, you no can, doubt. Yeah, so you can get the book at obliviousthebook.com. The name of the book is Oblivious, of course. Um, and the first, the, f- the name of the trilogy, sorry, is, uh, is Oblivious. And the first book is called Boundaries. So you can get that for free, no strings attached, at obliviousthebook.com. Obliviousthebook.com. And the first book Oblivious. is Boundaries. Oblivious. I've been told it's a good title. Everyone who's read it has said that the title is just perfect. Because I just had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. What What's the name of the next two books? I haven't decided yet. So I've, I've got some working titles in my head, but the, 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 we'll find that out soon, I think. Okay, so the next two books in the trilogy, do you have a timeline when you expect them to come out? Uh, not really. Um, the first book is, is very polished up. Uh, with, with writing a book, it takes... Quite after the first draft, it takes quite a bit of time to to get it right, uh, or, or to get it to a point where you know you're happy for another human being to read it. Right. Um, <laughs> so the the first book is definitely there. I'm very proud of that. Uh, books two and three are still very much raw, but all of the work is there. So it was actually quite easy for me to write a book because I took a journal on my trip. And my journal was enormous by the end of the trip. I was writing essays on practically every day that I spent there. So um, it's, it's very detailed. It's very raw. And it was, it, you'll read it like I'm talking to you. Like you, you, you'll come with me on the trip, I think, if you read it. Oh, I love it. I know that our listeners will too. So if you want to know what it's really like then to, to quit life and start living life, by getting on a Royal Enfield and going through Africa, these are the books for you. I apologize in advance for the very colorful language. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you've, you've, you've never read anything. <laughs> okay, I, I, I won't spoil it, but yeah, suffice to say, big disclaimer on the language. <laughs> so you use the language that expressed your feelings at the time. Yeah, when I talk about Africa, I tend to swear a lot, which, you know, I've been holding myself back on this interview because, you know, we'll keep it clean. But yeah, I think people, when they read the first page of the book, will uh, will know what they're in for for the rest of the trilogy. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for the disclaimer. We appreciate that very much. But yeah, well, cool, Luke. Man, I could have five more shows. I'd like to dive into more stories and I do know a couple of them that we didn't even touch on. You saved a man's life at one point that was drowning in the surf, right? That's a, that's a long story. I feel terrible about that. <laughs> <laughs> and you yeah, had, that's, uh, that, that's, that's a bittersweet one. Uh, and you had all the challenges of trying to manage hanging on to this bike and taking care of this bike through Africa. I know that that's got to be yeah. quite the story. I, I, I thought I was going to die a few times. Um, <laughs> so... There, there, there are a few life and death situations. Um, getting just getting the bike across borders is is interesting. Let's call it interesting, especially when you have no paperwork. So, right. part of my whole no planning bit was that I was really unprepared and I uh, didn't really have the paperwork. So I needed to uh, talk myself out of many an interesting situation. Oh, I'll bet. Would you recommend that people try to get the paperwork in place first, or do you like the adventure of that? Uh, it depends what kind of person you are. I, I would say that it's not 
Um, it's not mandatory. Uh, you don't have to have it. But if, if you don't want to be stressing every single time you go to a border, and there are a lot of borders, uh, you might want to get your paperwork in order because to say it's stressful would be an understatement. Mm. These people literally have, not literally, but they've, they've got your life in their hands and they can really play it any which way they want. And uh, you got to hope that they like you, otherwise you can get into some trouble. Maybe this serial anxiety at the borders had something to do with the panic attacks by the end. Could do. Like, twenty doing that 20-odd times is going to do anyone in nothing. <laughs> wild, man, <laughs> wild. Well, Luke, there's so much more to the story. Maybe we can have you on to hear more later, but at least people now can find out the rest by going to obliviousthebook.com. Yeah, maybe we can do a podcast trilogy. How about that? Hey, that would be fun. That really would. I mean, when people have done an epic journey like yours, I mean, we can do a great show on a single day just by diving into how the details play out, right? But when Um, we're talking about years... I could could do a podcast on every country if you want. (laughs) That would be a lot of fun. We're going to have to have you back on then and at least dive into some of the more interesting highlights because I feel like we just barely got started. We're out of time. The clock got us. But thank you so much for your time today, man. Oh, Thanks for my sharing. My pleasure. It. My pleasure. No problem, Scott. Very, very cool. For all of our listeners out there, wow. You know, we always say get out there and have some fun. It might be as simple as riding your bicycle around the neighborhood, or it might mean that you quit everything. You grab a motorbike and you see the world. Whatever that means for you, I hope that you're planning it and doing it and experiencing it. Get out there. Have some fun. On Monday's episode, Mason Gravely will be here to talk about climbing 14ers and some long-distance mountain bike riding. Until then, enjoy your weekend. Make sure you get out and have some fun.